But there are a lot of other actions that THC has. Uh, it's a powerful antiemetic in both animals and people and was used uh, quite uh, widely as a prescription medicine available for treating nausea and vomiting, for example, associated with cancer therapy, chemotherapy. Cancer chemotherapy is, is dreadfully associated with nausea and vomiting, very severe, may last for several days after the uh, chemotherapy uh, ends, and it's very distressing to, to the sufferers. And THC is one of the ways in which this can be treated quite well. But again, uh, patients tend to use smoked marijuana or cannabis rather than uh, the oral preparations. And nowadays we have lots of other medicines available which are very effective in treating this nausea and, 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 vom and vomiting. Uh, pleased to say one of those is a, a substance P antagonist, at last found a use for this neuropeptide. And uh, Ray uh, was instrumental in, in, in developing that drug and having it on the market for Merck as the first uh, neuropeptide substance P antagonist which had a real medical use. But of course we could use 5-HT3 antagonists as well and nowadays these are often used in conjunction. So we don't really need THC anymore with all the complications about delivery and intoxicant properties. So this is rather little used. Uh, then there's the stimulation of appetite and, and there's still a use for that in, in AIDS patients, although again they prefer to smoke rather than take the oral tablet. And there are, I'll show you, I'm sorry, okay, ahead of myself a bit here. There are other uh, actions which we can see for possible actions for cannabis antagonists, such as Ramonaban. Uh, Ramonaban was developed by Sanofi Aventis, a large pharmaceutical company. And they found, uh, not surprisingly, you might say, because we've said already THC stimulates appetite, not surprisingly, Ramonaban inhibits appetite. But in addition, it has actions all uh, uh, a variety of sites outside the brain. The appetite regulation center is thought to be a hypothalamus center in the brain. But outside the brain, in the fat cells themselves, and in the liver, there are also CB1 receptors. And the, the overall effect of Ramonaban is thought to, to be due to combination of central action and peripheral action. And, and this is the compound, for those uh, people that like chemical structures. This is Ramonabent. And here are some of the data on uh, weight reduction. The, the indication here was to treat people with morbid obesity and, and try and prevent the development of the so-called metabolic syndrome, which these patients tend to develop as a, as a prelude to developing full-blown di diabetes. So that was the indication. Sanofi actually uh, called it uh, treatment for the metabolic syndrome. They didn't mention obesity, didn't mention appetite. These are, these are dirty words in the pharmaceutical industry because there have been so many failed attempts to treat appetite with, uh, obesity with appetite suppressants. But anyway, here are some of the results. And they look pretty good. This is a, a placebo at the top, five milligram once a day, 20 milligrams once a day, uh, every day uh, for a year. And, the, and these are tested sporadically during the year. Large cohort of patients. Um, the patients are maintained on a restricted calorie diet, all of them. And that has some effect on the, on the placebo group. But you'll see you get quite a large effect with 20 milligrams per hour. And you're, you're losing at the end of the year something of the order of six kilograms. The reduction in fat comes largely from the abdominal visceral fat, which is, which is thought to be um, one of the high risk factors for heart disease. And you're losing here about um, as much as six or eight centimeters, which is you know, quite nice to have also for many people. So this all looked wonderful. Um, on the downside, however, on the right-hand side, if you go on doing this for another year, as long as you keep taking the drug, you're OK, you're down here. But if you stop taking the drug, your waistline creeps up to exactly where it was before. Your body weight creeps up to exactly where it was before. And I'm afraid this is typical of all pharmaceutical treatments for uh, obesity and weight gain. Same was true for the amphetamines in the old days. Take the amphetamine, you lose weight, you, you lose appetite, you lose weight, and then uh, you stop taking it and you go back up again to what seems to be something like a set point, which is hard to avoid. But that, that was the data. And, and Sanofi Aventis accumulated data on tens of thousands of patients, both sides of the Atlantic. Other pharmaceutical companies leapt into this, seeing dollar signs before their eyes for the first 
safe treatment for obesity and metabolic syndrome. Merck did a big program. Uh, Pfizer did a big program. Most of the major companies. Quite easy to find uh, a CB1 antagonist of their own and start clinical trials. And they all did that, but it all came to nothing because a small proportion of patients treated the Ramon event, tr developed uh, adverse psychiatric reactions, anxiety, low-level uh, psych psychosis, and worst of all, uh, suicidal thoughts. <coughs> and in Europe, the drug was on the market brief and briefly and then withdrawn in Europe about a, about a, a year ago, or February 2009, um, because of the possible link to suicide, never actually proven to be cause and effect link, but sufficiently worrying to cause the U European Medicines Agency to, to bring this off the market right away. The US uh, had already been cautious. The FDA had not approved the drug in America because of these uh, psychiatric side effects. And all the major companies that were doing clinical trials encountered something similar or gave up anyway because they saw they were fighting a lost cause. And by that time, uh, several hundred million dollars had been spent Pharmaceutical development doesn't always run smoothly. Let's take a look at snapshots of uh, medical cannabis around the world. Well, the Netherlands, as you know, has a very, had a very liberal policy towards cannabis, both medical and recreational. And in, in Netherlands today, uh, you can get prescription for herbal cannabis. Pretty good stuff. Uh, has about 18% THC content, cultivated uh, herbal cannabis. The indication for herbal cannabis is, again, MS uh, and certain other types of pain and certain other neurological conditions. I should add that in Canada, Sativex is approved not only for MS-associated pain, but also for cancer-associated pain. So it has two indications. In, in Canada, you can get a, a prescription for smoked cannabis available, although apparently it's not very good quality and people don't like it very much and Sativex is approved for these two indications. Now, the situation in the USA is, is very, very complex. You know, the USA, uh, uh, in general, has had a very hard-line policy on cannabis, uh, and the drug czar has been known to say uh, this should never be approved as a medicine because it gives the wrong message to young people that it's safe. Nevertheless, voters have voted uh, differently, and voters in, in various states where they can add things onto the ballot, propositions onto the ballot, uh, have approved cannabis pharmacies, which provide cannabis, her herbal cannabis, to patients as long as they come along to the pharmacy with a doctor's prescription for whatever indication the doctor thinks they might need it for. And uh, apparently in California, where this started, there are now more cannabis pharmacies than there are Starbucks coffee shops. So it's, it, it's true, there is, it's an extremely popular uh, new industry. But uh, there are problems. The problems are there's no legal source of supply, and the, the quality of the product that you get from different pharmacies is not controlled uh, in any sort of way, so that the, the, the smoke material that you get might have a low content or a high content of THC, and that, that's very, very uh, uncontrolled. And the federal U.S. government still maintains this is a totally illegal uh, substance. It shouldn't be used at all. It's, it's a Schedule One substance still. And what are you doing uh, uh, providing it uh, with prescriptions in cannabis pharmacies? So that states, several states are having a battle with the federal government, and, and occasionally the federal government will sell, send out raiding parties, as they used to do for the Indians in the old, old days, and, and, and break up the pharmacies. But President Obama said they shouldn't do that, so that doesn't happen quite as much. Nevertheless, there's still a lot of, uh, of uh, reservation about this whole thing. And, and for example, in <clears throat> Oakland, California, the city government voted recently to, to license a growing facility to provide good quality cannabis to the pharmacies. And at the same time, the state would make a tax revenue on it. So since California state and, and cities are desperately short of money, this seemed uh, like quite an attractive idea, but it was, it was shot down by the federal government again, who said that if anybody did that, they'd come out and bust up the uh, growing facility. So this is still a standoff. Nevertheless, uh, the, an enterprising company, Cannabis Science Inc., has set up, uh, which, which has the mission of trying to provide 
more standard medical grade uh, herbal cannabis and, and the, the burden of public opinion seems to be swinging very firmly in favor of allowing uh, cannabis medical use of pharmacies. And this is widespread, 15 states already approved and other states are considering uh, ballots on these on the same issue. So situation in, in the US is, is fluid.